welcome subscribers we are talking with Michael Tessarion and uh, we are going to dive into a topic I guess that is slowly kind of creeping in through the back door of our culture uh, and as you all know Michael prominently talks about stuff like genetic manipulation in his research in his books and his videos and uh, he points out that this is of course is something that we can find traits traits of in uh, the past but this is now again becoming uh, common in, in our world, in, in our time, and genetics and nanotechnology and stuff like this seems to be developing into the new kind of IT bubble almost, and I um, wanted to spend some time today with Michael on topics like transhumanism and of course also the development of uh, AI, artificial intelligence and the cyborg and much much more and um, how this kind of connect with, with stuff like the implementation of the implantable microchip and Michael I, I've felt for a long time now that you know kind of humanity is in for big changes up ahead and I never thought of this uh, as something to do with, with technological in, in, quote, in quotes here improvements of humanity but now this seems to be kind of developing as a very plausible scenario what, what's your take on that? Well, first we have to realize that technology um, is not something new. It's just even looking at the meaning of the word, the word technology is an Egyptian word. Tech, T-E-K, was how it was spelled back in Egyptian times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a religion. It was part of, it was part of a, a worship connects to the name of the serpent. Uh, so that, again, we have the serpent symbol being very much at the heart of the symbolism connected to technology. But technology has been on this planet for aeons. In my work, you see, um, we were visited about 50,000 years ago by beings, off-world beings, who have been you know, instrumental in our civilization during a great war that they had in the past, uh, the so-called War of the Gods that all the mythologies talk about. They lost all of their technological hardware. This was a war that was fought with incredible weaponry and sophisticated hardware, but the war was so severe that it actually precipitated enormous earth changes and a lot of authors and a lot of scientists have been able to discover now information that the earth did go through these great cataclysms but they haven't drawn the right conclusions one of the most important understandings is that the technology of the ancients the technology that built the you know the temple of solomon the technology that built the pyramid hmm. the technology that um, the maya are known to have used in their calendars the technology that built the first ships that you know navigated the seas in ages long past Basically, the technology that uh, created the ancient world and also the empires of the historical age. Yeah, this yeah. <laughs> technology was lost. So when we find ourselves today in a silicon age, in a cybernetic age, we have to understand there's nothing new about that. It's mm -hmm. only because we have a myopic historical vision and that we have historical amnesia that we think that it's only since the Renaissance or it's only since the Industrial Age or the Agricultural Age, you see, that man built machines and man had, uh, you know, railways and man started getting into the concept of uh, machinery and technology yeah. and all of that. Yeah. This is an age-old movement, and we are just been provided or given a very small, limited vision, modern vision, into it. But if you look at the symbols that the corporations of the great technological corporations are using today, and some of the memes and the, you know, the uh, logos that they're using... Yeah you will see that they are also referring to their ancient, ancient roots. So yeah. what we're seeing today is but the arrowhead of a long arrow stretching way back into time. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing that, that kind of uh, m might be ridiculous at, at first to, to do this comparison, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, series and stuff in our popular, popular culture now, like, you know, Battlestar Galactica and stuff like this, who kind of... I guess they relay this kind of general idea that that um, you know in our past we had you know <laughs> this very sophisticated technology and and I guess uh, in that series they kind of you know are chased chased by uh, different um, you know basically robots or they create this a AI that takes its own li uh, takes life of its own and kind of uh, uh, enslaves humanity I guess but that's right in yeah, the organic computer you yeah. know, the Kubrick yeah ex uh, everyone from Kubrick all the way back to the famous sci-fi equator mass of British science fiction yeah to uh, Star Trek to Blake 7 to Doctor Who you know yeah, yeah. Um, we have had many people under the guise of fiction even Tolkien and C.S. Lewis these are people in the know but they, re they were in the know, so much in the know, that they knew that if they didn't write 
their work in fiction, they would lose their jobs, they'd lose their lives. So they knew, they understood that the Royal Academy and the Royal Societies and the Royal Dynasties of, of the world who are funding these Silicon Valley groups mm. and funding this genetic research, because even though they call the Silicon Valley Silicon Valley, three quarters of the companies in the Silicon Valley have nothing to do with silicon. They're all genetics. Did yeah. you know that? Yeah, it's very yeah. interesting. The Silicon Valley is three quarters of the economy there is run by companies that are into genetics, yeah. not just uh, silicon chips. Hmm. So there's a, there's a big disguise going on. And the people who knew, either from insiders, you know, who were whistleblowers, mm. or people who had used their own intelligence to study the subject outside, they knew that if they were to talk about the true occult, roots of technology, mm -hmm. which is what I'm into. Yeah. They knew that they would not get very far, and in the Victorian age and in the, in the early 20th century, they knew they wouldn't, their books would never survive. So they wrote in fiction. So you're absolutely right that Gene Roddenberry and Glenn Larson and Gene L. Kuhn and many of the Doctor Who are brilliant, brilliant men who wrote these stories, mm -hmm. uh, starting, of course, with Terry Nation. These are enormous influences in my work. Mm -hmm. Because they tell you as it is, but they tell you as it is in a, la in a right brain way. Yeah. But you have to connect the dots. They just put it there uh, in an artistic form and leave you. You see, I mean, the famous creature that uh, Terry Nation used to write about in Doctor Who was the Daleks. Anyone who's a Doctor Who fan and other people have heard about the Daleks, right? Yeah, yeah. It turned out that the Daleks, the Dalek is a word in Czechoslovakian that means alien being. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Here we One go. from out there. Uh. <laughs> so is this coincidence or is it intentional? You know, yeah. these people work on a highly symbolic level. Yeah. And I find no fault at all in some of these incredible, incredible fictional works to tell us an amazing tale about the world we're living in. Exactly, exactly. And, um, and uh, you know, you have stuff like, of course, you know, movies, um, the, the Matrix, you know, they, we got the AI taking over and, and basically enslaving us, putting us in, in these... Uh, Pod world basically, and the, yeah. then we have the Terminator, you know, walking, talking machines that are, again oh, are brilliant films. slaves of. Yeah, I mean, uh, could, and this could this be kind of also reflections of our, I guess, um, our, our you know fears on a more psychological level that we kind of deal with these scenarios in this way that we make movies about it and then go watch watch them. They are. Uh, they're very much that. They are alter, you know, parts of our alter ego. Um, they um, we. Basically, a lot of what the science fiction people are saying, what I think, I think the greatest, the greatest writers tend to talk about this post-human man, you know, the post-cybernetic man, yeah. which is a creature. We've talked on other shows about the inauthentic man, yeah. right, and about yeah. the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the man's whole life is motivated by the guilt that he has from living in an inauthentic life. Yeah, exactly. So the, techno the technological man is also connected to this guilt complex. Yeah. yeah. If you... If you live your life so in an anti-human way, meaning if you have no idea, you're living as a human being, but you're not really human. You're more, you've dumbed yourself down hmm. to the level of such an automaton. You're basically a programmed automaton because you've been programmed by your parents. You've been programmed by your peers. You've been yeah. programmed by the teachers, you see. You've been programmed by the media, as almost every young adult today is programmed by the media. It's yeah. almost unbelievable. Yeah. It's almost wor working on remote control. <laughs> Anything they see on in television, five minutes later, they're into it. Worse exactly. than ever before. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and once, if you do this and you reduce yourself, so this mechanistic or what you might call technotronic, this is the word that, you know, uh, Brzezinski yeah. uses, the yeah. technotronic exactly. world that they're trying to create. Well, they've been successful. Man is living as a technotronic automaton. Hmm. So he has reduced himself to the, uh, what in Doctor Who they have, the, uh, the uh, Cybermen. Mm, yeah. A part, part human, part organic, part uh, human. It's thinking. It's all in your thinking. Your thinking can become come so super rational, so technological, uh, so so anti-human, so anti-organic, so yeah. anti-feminine, that your thinking can become literally the thinking of a robot, of a machine, something that can in fact be programmed. That is the origin of the technological man. And of course, that individual will feel more at home in a world of technology and cold machines. Yeah. Then he will amongst warm human beings with with passions and with reality. Star Trek, you know, Captain Kirk is the perfect example of this passionate human. Yeah. You know, who who, who kind of who he would even argue with God, which is he, he, what he did in Star <laughs> Trek Five. Yeah. You know, which is the projection of the human ego. Yeah. As, as why why does why would God want want with a starship kind yeah. of concept? This yeah. is the human. And Captain Kirk represents this human being. Yeah who is so rebellious and so free in his mind and his thinking that he'll even argue with God at the last minute. 
It's a brilliant, brilliant motif. Yeah, yeah. And people get out Star Trek One, which is the movie I'm thinking of. They have a fantastic rendition in there. That there is another kind of um, uh, unification that can take place, which is androgyny. At the end of that movie, you basically see a magical act mm -hmm, of, a, mm -hmm. of, of a chemical wedding. If you watch that movie again, you will see that the two beings, male and female, mm -hmm. come together and they join in this unison. And they literally blend together. It's a fantastic movie about the chemical wedding, mm. the first Star Trek movie. Yeah. And they have to, but first of all, you know, the, the woman appears to them as a robot, as an automaton, as a probe. Yeah. She gets possessed, you see. So they're talking about the feminine being possessed by the masculine first in a negative way, yeah. being possessed by the spirit of the technological brain. Uh. And just being used as a sort of a you know an android for that, and then later on when she recovers her femininity, mm -hmm. which is a, a great story of the, of the loss of femininity and the reawakening to that. And I don't mean in females; females can be as, just as masculine as most men, and so yeah. men can be very feminine. So I'm not yeah. talking about gender here. Yeah. I'm talking about meta gender. I'm talking about uh, archetypes. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, you, you spoke also about, of course, about the. The kind of, uh, I guess we can call it robotification, basically, of humanity. And but, but it seems to be a kind of a misnomer that we are kind of awaiting this, uh, you know, this, as if we are to put it in Star Trek uh, terms, the the Borg race taking over, uh, or or the cyborg then. But just as you say, it feels like it's not necessary because it it, it does the trick with basic programming, and we have kind of. Many humans today, I guess, are, live on this basic, uh, you know, e emotional level that they are kind of waiting for a signal and then and then um, process it and then you know basically gives it back. It, it's like a a very very mechanical approach to life in general. And there there we have the the robot right there, just as you say. That's right. Dumb, you know, Malthus and uh, these uh, philosophers wanted to dumb down man to the level of the machine. Yeah. On a more psychological level, this identification, this uh, this this uh, robotization, as you're saying, this uh, automatic, like a man being an automaton, yeah, yeah, happens because man has literally identified with his leaders. Hmm. See, the leaders are already, in my belief, literally physically descended from Atlanteans, off-world beings who were technologically advanced. Yeah, we are living in the mirror image of our masters who are technological, even even in the prehistorical age. They're making us in their image. Yeah. <laughs> we are their um, servants. Yeah. No more and no less. They have only kept us around, and certainly the middle class is in great jeopardy now because they really don't need us anymore. Yeah. So hmm. from one angle, you see, they've only kept us around because we've been of service to them in their journey to build back the technology to get to the point where they can restore the weaponry and the technology that they have. These are technotronic people from a technotronic planet from a technotronic age on their own. Yeah. And they came here, infected this planet, and have been basically making us in their image. However, the dumbed-down, we still have a human aspect to ourselves, but you see, the human aspect is identifying with the power. I talked about this in the, in the presentation, The Future of Mankind, yeah. that how it is that we identify with those who have power. We give our power away, and then we're seduced into identifying with the object of our hatred. We, so, in other words, by identifying with the leaders, we model ourselves on these cyborg-type Atlantean descendants, yeah. the, the creature, the, the children of the Nephilim. Yeah. And yeah. because we are so in slave think, the slave think allows us to identify with those who might murder us, who might kill us, the people who pay our bills, the people who give us a certain amount of, uh, of, of life, survival, you know, uh, enough for survival. Yeah. So we have psychologically identified with our own controllers. And yeah. the controllers use this identification to the greatest maximum means. Yeah. And therefore we ingest and digest everything that these people hand us. So <laughs> if they say,